Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers and the foundation for inviting me to this wonderful meeting. I really appreciate the invitation. So I'm going to be talking to you about global epigenetic changes that I think are, or we have evidence, are leading to gene silencing and the activation of transposable elements. And we work in a cellular model, and I would just like to quickly remind everybody that there are really two fundamental, fundamentally different mechanisms of cellular aging. One is chronological aging of typically post-mitotic, fully differentiated cells. It's basically macromolecular homeostasis and how this plays out over chronological time. And there's another very interesting model that is replicative aging, which is essentially the counting of cell divisions. And that's the model that we started working with. And there was a wonderful introduction to this earlier in the morning. Uh, we're really talking about replicative cellular senescence and the Hayflick limit. And this is just the uh, experiment that we did in my lab that completely recapitulates the observations that Hayflick made several decades ago. And the model system is normal human fibroblasts that are simply passage into what we call replicative exhaustion. So they shorten their telomeres. This triggers a DNA damage response, which then triggers senescence, or the aficionados M1 senescence. The cells are stable. Uh, their karyotypes don't really change. They can be you know, maintained in cell culture for very, very long time. So everything I'm going to be telling you today uh, was obtained in this model system. We have been interested for many years in tracking or at least asking the question, uh, to what extent does cellular senescence, these, these phenomena that we're studying in the culture dish, exist in vivo? And I don't have a lot of time to tell you about this. Uh, there was a lot of skepticism some years ago, I think now, the prevailing opinion is that cellular senescence actually does occur in vivo, and it has an important <coughs> pro-aging property. We were interested in developing a number of assays to track senescent cells. You've heard of the TIF assay, the telomere-induced dysfunction foci. We did a lot of work on that, but one assay that we were particularly interested in a few years ago is changes in heterochromatin that were observed in senescent cells, first by Masashi Narita, when he was in Scott Rowe's lab at Cold Spring Harbor, I believe he now has his own lab here in Cambridge. And what he observed is that when cells became senescent, their genomes became reorganized. He first noticed this very punctate pattern in adapi stain preparation, and then he later showed that these foci actually co-localized with foci immunostain with, for example, some variants of histones that associate with heterochromatin or proteins that are known to be uh, associated with heterochromatin. H HB1 stands for heterochromatin protein. So we started looking into this and we in fact found that in cell culture, not only did we see this reorganization, but we actually saw a net increase in the abundance of these heterochromatin proteins, which is demonstrated here. We developed some very sensitive immunofluorescent assays that allowed us to track this in tissues. And we also found that in uh, quite a few tissues, both in mice and in primates, heterochromatin seemed to accumulate with advanced age. I'm not going to show that because that has been published. What I'd like to turn to is some more recent studies where we ask at the whole genome level, what is actually happening you know, in terms of the distribution of heterochromatin and euchromatin? I mean, it's good to see that you get these foci. Uh, bulk heterochromatin seems to go up, but what is actually happening uh, at the DNA sequence level? And we use a method that you may not be familiar with, so I'm going to introduce it. It's called formaldehyde assisted isolation of regulatory regions, or FAIR. It was developed by Jason Lee, initially in yeast, and then adapted to mammalian cells. And for those of you who are familiar with doing chromatin immunoprecipitations, this is exactly the same protocol, except you don't use an antibody. 
Okay, so what you do is you cross like with formaldehyde, you shear to get your chromatin, but then instead of immunoprecipitating it, you extract it with phenol. Okay, and I think this is a really stupid idea, which is exactly what I thought when I first read the paper. But essentially what happens is that the formaldehyde is cross-linking histones to DNA. And then the phenol is pulling all the proteins into the organic phase. And by virtue of cross-linking, something like 99.9% .9 of the DNA ends up in the phenol phase. And the only thing that ends up in the aqueous phase is small pieces of DNA that are relatively histone-free or protein-free. Okay? And then you can take that fraction. Initially, what we did is we used uh, Affymetrix whole genome tile arrays. And now more recently, we used whole genome sequencing on the Illumina sequencer. Now, I should also tell you that uh, this is not a totally exotic method. Uh, it's been used quite extensively in the ENCODE and MOD ENCODE project. So there's a fair amount of data that has already been deposited. And in general, what is found is, as you would expect, you get peaks over transcriptional start sites enhancers and origins of replication. So it's really very preferentially enriching sequences that have a relatively open confirmation. Now when we do this in normal pre-senescent growing cells and senescent cells, what we see is really the expected very strong peak over transcriptional start sites. But what we are seeing is that we're losing the number of genes that have this signature in senescent cell. So this is all 20,000 RefC genes in the human genome, and we're going from about 10,000 genes with an open signature to about 7,500. And if you look at the magnitude of the peak in the open cluster, it, al it also goes down, okay? So things are being shut down. You are losing gene activity, activity is low. This is demonstrated here where we do a two-dimensional plot of fair enrichment versus gene expression that was done in the microarray. And you can see right away, you're losing fair signal, you're moving down. And this blob here, that's the closed gene cluster. Okay, so you can see that the number of genes in the closed gene cluster is increasing very significantly. This is very old data, uh, but it was really puzzling. This actually comes from the whole genome tiling array, which is kind of a crude platform. And what you're looking at is you're looking at the average fair signal in the sliding window across the whole chromosome, okay? And you shouldn't read too much into uh, the intensity of the color because this is an artificial uh, heat, heat map. But one thing that is immediately striking is the remarkable smoothening that you see in senescent cells. So you start with a profile that's very rich in detail, and you're ending up with a profile that's very, very smooth. So this is the fair seat data. I'd like to go over this in a little bit of detail because this is really the take home message of the talk. So I'm going to walk you through some of these tracks. This track shows early and late replicating regions of the genome. Okay, you may know that the genome is divided into very large blobs. Some of them replicate very late, and uh, that is demonstrated here. Okay? These late replicating blocks happen to be very poor or, or gene poor. These are the RefSeq gene, and sometimes people refer to these regions as gene deserts. And you can see there's one gene here and almost four megabases of DNA, okay? All the CPG islands are clustered in this gene-rich region, and over here there's almost no CPG islands in this gene desert. If you look at a number of other tracks, DNA's hypersensitivity, fair, and occupancy by DNA polymerase two, you will see this remarkable partition. This is the gene-rich region. This is the late replicating gene-poor region. This is believed to be a fundamental architectural feature of the human genome because it is conserved across most tissues and cell lines. 
What you're seeing here is the lymphoblastoid celli and the HeLa celli, completely different. The architecture is very, very similar. If you look at histone marks for activation and re regression, you can see that HDK4 trimethyl, which is an activating mark, gives you a very spiky pattern over the gene-rich region. In contrast, HDK9 trimethyl, which is a mark of heterochromatin, shows you this phenomenal block here, okay? So this is basically the feature of, uh, one of the basic features of the human genome. And now to our data, this blue track is early passage growing cells, lots of signal peaks over TSSs, as you would expect, nothing in the gene pool region. If you look at the senescent cells, you see this remarkable swinging again, okay? So this is consistent with the loss of signal and closing of the gene-rich regions, but what is happening with the gene-poor regions, okay? So you may ask yourself, well, does anybody actually live in those parts, okay? And the answer is that uh, very prominent occupants of those parts are transposable elements, or mobile genetic elements that were first discovered by Barbara McClintock and Mays, but since that time have been shown to be pretty much ubiquitous in every species that has been examined. And in some species, they actually occupy very large portions of the genome. They are believed to be molecular parasites that date back to the prebiotic dawn of time, uh, at the time when RNA was the first self-replicating molecule is when these parasites arose because to this day, class two self-splicing introns use exactly the same catalytic mechanism chemically as retrotransposons in the absence of any proteins. When life then trans transitioned to uh, cellular life, genomes became DNA, well, for that conversion, you need reverse transcriptase. In fact, reverse transcriptase is the enzyme that to this day is used by retrotransposons to move throughout our genomes. In humans, about 45% of our genomes are comprised of a variety of transposable elements. Most of them are retrotransposons. Retrotransposons have a very interesting life cycle. Uh, the elements sit in our genome as double-stranded DNA. They are transcribed. The messages are transported into the cytoplasm where they are combined with the proteins that they encode. And one of the proteins is the reverse transcriptase, which then migrates with the RNA back into the nucleus and catalyzes the insertion, a new insertion of the element at a new genomic site. Now, as you may uh, think, Cells defend themselves quite vigorously against these parasites. There are multiple levels of defense. The first one is heterochromatic silence. So these elements in our genome are for the most part incorporated into constitutive heterochromatin and they are really never, as far as we believe until recently, expressed in somatic cells. There are also other mechanisms. So let me take you through some of the bioinformatic data. If you're doing Illumina sequencing and you use standard uh, bioinformatic pipelines, the first thing that you obviously do is you map against the genome, and then the algorithm throws out any sequence that maps more than once. So it throws out all the transposable elements. So we develop computational pipelines that specifically can deal with this highly repetitive data. And that's what I'm showing you here. These are all the families of ALU elements. ALUs are very short, non-autonomous retrotransposons, okay? And as you may expect, they are uh, depleted in fair relative to other sequences, or relative to in input. But if you compare senescent and pre-senescent cells, you can see that all the subfamilies of ALUs are now becoming relatively enriched. So they're bucking the trend, okay? RefSeq genes are being uh, de depleted in fair. 
and uh, atoms are being enriched. Now these are L1 elements, okay? This is the one active family in the human genome that is capable of transposition to this day. And here you see a more uh, complex, complex pattern. You can see that a large block of them behave as RefC genes. On average, they are being actually shut down. But then you have this one cluster that seems to be enriched. If you look at this a little bit more closely, the ones that are being enriched are the human and primate specific subfamilies. Okay? So you have 400,000 approximately line one elements in your genome. The vast majority of them are fossils that have been around there for millions of years and are no longer capable of transposition. The ones that the cell really cares about are these guys. There's only several thousand of them. They are evolutionarily recent, and some of them are capable of transposing. So you may say, well, you know, this is very nice. Uh, bioinformatics can tell you all kinds of interesting things. So we actually did some biochemistry to verify this. We used uh, radioactive dot plots to demonstrate the enrichment of L1 and L sequences in fair DNA. We did qPCR to look at RNA expression. And we actually did qPCR on DNA to measure copy number. Okay, and by this very sensitive multiplex assay, we can actually see that these elements are transposed. Okay, so the sequence is the chromatin becomes open, they start being transcribed into RNA, and at later times, they actually start actively transposing throughout the genome. So this is just some of the more detailed uh, data. We made primers that are specific to individual elements. You can actually do this because they have polymorphisms that you can exploit in your primary design. So this is just a sprinkling of uh, individual L1 elements on different chromosomes uh, belonging to these two primate subfamilies. And you can see that all of them are becoming enriched and fair, and most of them are being transcriptionally activated as well. Now, interestingly, satellite sequences follow this opening trend, okay? And satellites are simple repeats that are located predominantly at centromeres, pericentromeres, and telomeres. They don't transpose, but they are a very important part of the cellular constitutive heterochromatin fraction, okay? Uh, these are some of the most heavily heterochromatinized regions of the genome. And you can see, so here we're using uh, a probe to uh, human satellite 2, HSAT2. And you can see that this likewise is becoming enriched in the fair fraction. In fact, this is visible even by microscopy. If you do fish with a pericentromeric probe, you can see that in young cells, you visualize these very nice bright spots. These are the centromeres. And senescent cells, these spots are getting visibly distended, spread out over larger volumes. You can use electron microscopy, which is in fact the method that about four decades ago was used to coin the term heterochromatin. And by electron microscopy, you see heterochromatin as dark staining regions that very often cluster under the nuclear membrane. Okay? So that's where most of your centromeres and telomeres are located under the nuclear membrane in these domains of very densely packed what we think of constitutive heterochromatin. And you can see that in senescent cells, these uh, regions are also becoming more open. So let me summarize. Uh, what I would like to really convey to you today is that heterochromatin marks and proteins, in fact, heterochromatin by a number of assays, we use DNA sensitivity that I didn't have time to show you, increases in senescent cells and also in aging tissues of mouse and primates. The magnitude of and sorry, I should say the number of open genes, the number of transcribed genes, and the level of transcription 
is actually going down. And we see this in FAIR, and we have additional assays where we, for example, measured total mRNA pools normalized to either DNA, nuclear DNA content, or milligram of tissue. This goes down, okay? So these are all very consistent trends. Gene activity is being shut down. However, in a very peculiar way, the, re the transposable elements, in particular the RTEs, are becoming more open, they are being expressed, and then they are actually being uh, transposed. They are trans transposed. And I didn't have data uh, to show you this is very preliminary, but we're also seeing similar trends in tissues. Everything I showed you so far is in senescent fibroblasts in the culture. Okay. Uh, so this really now begs the question, is this maybe a more general phenomenon or is it really just restricted to replicative senescence? Now, somatic transposition is actually a process that is very poorly understood. There's a big literature on transposable elements, but it's pretty much res restricted to studies on the germline. Because when you sequence a genome, uh, you can see that these elements move between species, but the only thing you're seeing is the movement in the germline, because anything that transposes in the somatic tissues will die with you, okay? Now, it was believed until recently that there was really no significant transposition in somatic tissues, and that, I think, is going to be wrong. And there are a number of uh, studies that already point to that very prominently in cancer, okay? From the thousand cancer genomes, retrotransposal elements are moving around. Okay, to an unprecedented degree, and in that field, there's a lively debate going on whether these are passenger or driver events, okay? There's also a body of work, uh, mostly by uh, Fred Gage, that has demonstrated that transposition occurs in the developing nervous system. And so what we are adding to this body of work is our evidence that somatic transposition becomes activated in cellular senescence, and we also believe in aging. Now, you can probably imagine that transposition is profoundly del deleterious, and there's a large literature on this where transposition was uh, by genetic tricks, let's say in Drosophila or in the mouse, uh, allowed to happen in the germline, and this typically results in sterility. Okay, so, you know, transposition has highly destabilizing effects on the genome, obviously by insertional mutagenesis, but there are additional mechanisms that have come to light, and that is there seem to be many abortive transposition events that actually result in double-strand breaks in the genome. So I think what may be happening is that these retrotransposable elements are beginning to be activated, and what this really creates is uh, a DNA damage response in the, in the cell. You may ask yourself what activates these elements to begin with, and again, there is a literature on that. They are known to be activated by a variety of stresses, including DNA damage, oxidative stress, and heat shock. So as all good parasites, they know when to leave. Okay? So you can see the potential for feed-forward loops where initial DNA damage may create a situation where these transposable elements are being transcribed, and then this is now driving further DNA damage. The one thing that I think is very interesting is, how much time do I have? There is a category of drugs that inhibit reverse transcriptases by blocking the catalase. These are very famous. AZT is the first one. They have a long history in antiviral therapy for HIV AIDS and also HBV. Okay, so these are drugs that are so old that some of them are now generic. Okay, the, the, the first wave of drugs were quite toxic but subsequent uh, generations of drugs have reduced toxicity, and in fact, some of them 
are still being used today in this multifactorial treatment that is, that is used for, for AIDS. As it happens, some of these inhibit the human L1 reverse transcriptase. Not all of them, some of them. They were never screened for efficacy against L1. It, it just happened. And there's actually three or four that inhibit L1 uh, reverse transcriptase with very high efficiency and can actually be used uh, to test in models like cell culture or the mouse whether inhibiting this process has any effects on the phenotypes of senescence or aging, which is what we are doing now. And so with that, I would like to close. This, this is our model where we get the liberation from heterochromatin, the transposition that then drives further DNA damage and cellular dysfunction. And with that, I would like to thank my group and my funders at the NIA, and we'll be happy to take questions.